So in this uh, lecture, we're going to begin a new section uh, called the defects in crystals. And I just want to give you a brief overview today, um, mostly focusing on uh, how, how we're going to approach this from a thermodynamic perspective, and then just giving you a real brief preview of the kinds of things that we'll be uh, delving into in this uh, section. So I want to start with just a brief discussion of, of potential energy. Um, some of this was motivated by some of the questions uh, several of you were posting in the on the discussion board about um, uh, why bond energies were negative and things like that. So I wanted to take some time to address that just because we're going to revisit potential energy. So this seemed like a good, uh, a good time to do that. So let's just think about the potential energy that we're used to from maybe a dynamics class or a status class where it's where our only potential energy really is gravity. So uh, there, there's a, a, a little dude sitting on, on a elevated platform of height H1 above some other platform and and if we were to define the potential energy from gravity we would say that the potential energy is equal to m times g times h1 right um, and and uh, hopefully that would be pretty straightforward if on the other hand i took i left uh, this uh, this uh, gentleman here on the platform and i brought in a tractor and i dug out the uh, the next platform so that i now the height was h2 it's a, it's a higher now but the, but the guy on the on the platform never moved. Um, in in reality, would we what would we say about the potential energy? Well, we would say that now it's mg times h two. Even though physically nothing happened to the to the guy on the platform, right? Um, and then let me let me go the opposite direction. Let me say that I built a platform up so that it's above the guy. Then then how I would would I define the potential energy for that uh, the the guy on the platform? Uh, well, it would be negative m times g times h3, right, where g is the gravitational constant, or the acceleration of gravity, rather. So my point in all of this is that the the, the person uh, sitting on, a, on the platform, right, that not, as far as that person was concerned, nothing changed, whether I brought in a tractor or whether I, I, I filled in and made an enormous hill, right? It's all the same. It's because potential energy is not an absolute quantity. It, what matters is the difference between potentials, okay? So um, if I were to take one step off of the platform in each of those cases, right, uh, I'm going to achieve a higher acceleration if I fall from a distance h2 than if I fall from a distance h1, and I'm going to achieve uh, no velocity if I, if I uh, in the third case, where I have to climb the hill, right? So... The same thing occurs with atomic bond potentials. So uh, this is the, the picture that I had showed you before of uh, some hypothetical potential energy curve for copper. And some of you were disturbed that the, uh, the potential energy was negative most of the time. But uh, in this case, we, we just chose a reference state that was different than maybe what you would have liked to cho have chosen. We basically said that the bond potential energy is going to be referenced to an atom in an unbonded state. So the bonding reduces the energy, but the unbonded state we call, uh, that's, our, that's our reference state. So when we move atoms, uh, separate them by a, an infinite distance, that's our reference state. And all this is saying in this potential energy curve is that we're reducing the energy by bringing the atoms closer together. So the potential energy difference tells you something about the spont about spontaneous reactions. If uh, the, the reaction reduces the potential energy, so uh, for example, if in my, my little um, diagram of this man on a platform, if he walks off this edge, his potential energy is going to be reduced as he, as he falls right to his death. Uh, same thing on H2. So those would be spontaneous reactions. In contrast, I don't see myself going up in an elevator here, right? I, this, this reaction, I can't climb up here spontaneously. I'm, I'm required to put in energy to make that happen. So it's not spontaneous, okay? I know that's kind of a horses and duckies explanation of potential energy, and um, probably there's a more sophisticated way to do it. But, but um, I think it suffices for this class and for what we're trying to get across, okay? So now, why did I do all that? Because I'm going to introduce a, a new type of energy, or, and maybe it's new to you. I guess I don't know. Um, I don't expect you to have seen it, I guess. And that's the Gibbs free energy. 
And all the Gibbs free energy says is that for some transformation or reaction that occurs at constant temperature and pressure, the relevant governing potential energy for the stability of the system is the Gibbs free energy. We call that G. We define it as H minus TS. So now think back to thermodynamics. Do you remember H is the enthalpy, which we defined as U plus the PV uh, work term? And S is entropy. Obviously, T is temperature. Okay? Uh, and then if you uh, want to define a little further, U is the internal energy of the system, which is the sum of the total kinetic energy plus the potential energy, right? So that's where your bond energy terms would come into play, uh, the atomic bond energy, okay? So, but we're usually interested in, uh, just, just as we did in the previous slide, the absolute value is not as interesting to us as the the relative value relative to, to states nearby. So we're interested in the change, of G, the change of the Gibbs free energy. And so we typically write delta G, the change in Gibbs free energy, is equal to the change in the enthalpy minus the temperature times the change in the uh, en uh, entropy. Okay? One of the key features that you should take away from the Gibbs free energy, again, uh, we're not deriving this. If this was a materials thermodynamics class, we would derive it. Um, or if it was a statistical mechanics class or something like that, we would. But in this class, I just want you to use it. Um, so as with other potential energy forms, it's the change in the Gibbs free energy that's going to tell us whether a spontaneous reaction can occur. Um, and, and what do I mean by a spontaneous reaction? Um, what if I have a, um, if you watched a couple lectures ago, we talked about uh, polymorphism. So I have uh, uh, iron, for example, at a higher, a higher temperature that's an FCC and I cool it down and it wants to become BCC, right? But uh, when I say it wants to become, it seeks to become, what I mean is that it will lower its Gibbs free energy by transforming to that new phase. Right? That's what drives it. And so it's a spontaneous reaction going that direction. So the spontaneous reaction occurs when delta G, the change in the Gibbs free energy, if we were to ha have the reaction, if that lowers the Gibbs free energy, then, then that's spontaneous. And it does not occur uh, if delta G is greater than zero. So the stability of the system is going to be determined by balancing, decreasing the enthalpy, right? That's going to reduce the Gibbs free energy. And if we increase the ent entropy, that will also reduce the Gibbs free energy. Notice that this, there's a subtraction here. So if I want delta G to be less than zero, then what I need is to make this value small, so reduce the enthalpy, and I need to make this value delta S large, right? Or I can also increase the temperature. Um, and then just kind of like I mentioned, if I want to make the contribution of entropy higher, uh, I can do that by increasing the temperature, as you can see how it plays out here. If I double the temperature, uh, I double the um, the effect of entropy. And in this particular uh, equation, temperature is an absolute uh, quantity. It's not in, in things like Celsius. It'll be in something like um, a Kelvin or Rankine. Okay? So let's talk about equilibrium. We just got done saying that uh, a system is stable when a spontaneous reaction does not occur. And, and that uh, for any other system state, what we want is delta G to be higher than zero, right? So what does that mean? If I'm in a position and any other direction I go, I raise the potential energy. That means that uh, I'm at a minimum in my Gibbs free energy, okay? So the equilibrium or the stable state occurs when the Gibbs free energy is at a minimum, okay? So burn that into your brain. That's how equilibrium is defined in our systems, okay? If Gibbs... If the Gibbs free energy is at a local minimum, not the global minimum, then the system is said to be in what's called a metastable state. And we'll use that um, throughout. In fact, um, uh, it, when we get to talking about heat treating of steel, sometimes we'll want to create um, martensite. Martensite is not an equilibrium phase of steel, but we can create it anyway because it exists as a metastable state. And so we'll talk about uh, how we do that and why and whatnot as we, as we move along. But let me give you just a, an illustration here. So here is a, a curve. Uh, on the, on the x-axis, I'm just showing you states. And then the, the y-axis, I'm showing you the Gibbs free energy. Now, states are somewhat hard to define because they can be such a variety of different things. So for example, in this case, maybe state 1 is BCC and state 2 is FCC. 
Um, but it, but it could be uh, the position of a vacancy. Uh, it could be a whole number of things that would that could define a state. The bottom line is it just goes from one one position to the other. Okay, so if we go ahead and look at this um, this particular graph and we try to use our definitions, we can see that state two in this case could be would be an equilibrium, and that state uh, one would be a metastable state. It's not an equilibrium, right? So. Um, but the question is, is can we get from the metastable state to the equilibrium state so that sometimes we'll end up with states, uh, as I mentioned about um, uh, Martin site, that, that we can kind of lock in even though they're not the equilibrium state. And what we uh, can observe is that in order for me to get from one state to the other, I typically have to overcome uh, or get, above, get over an energy barrier. Um, and we call uh, that that barrier we call that the activation energy. So I have to I have to add an activation energy to get to this lower energy state. So if I'm in the, this state one and I want to get to state two, I have to add energy delta G to get me over that hump back into to this new state. Okay, so we call that the activation energy. Uh, that's going to come into play uh, as we as we talk about things like vacancies. Okay, so that's that's a really high level overview of the thermodynamics that we're going to use. Um, as you can see, it's a little bit hand wavy. We're not going to go into sort of the hardcore definitions and derivations. I just want you to be aware uh, of some critical things like the ideas of equilibrium and activation energy and metastable states. I want you to be able to understand that when we to achieve equilibrium, we have to balance. Uh, we want to increase entropy and decrease enthalpy, and there's that balance that is going to define what equilibrium is for us. So those are the key features that I want you to be aware of. As far as the types of defects that we're going to talk about uh, in, this, in this chapter on crystals, uh, we're going to, first we're going to show that every single crystal always contains defects. Um, and it's going to be as a result of the entropic contribution of the Gibbs free energy. If you don't understand what that means, don't panic. I'll cover that uh, when we talk about uh, particularly point defects. Um, but we're going to discuss four types of um, uh, uh, crystal defects. Zero D or just point defects. And those would be things like vacancies, interstitials, and substitutions. So I'm showing you an example here where an, an atom has been removed from the lattice. And that's a vacancy, right? So now, now there's a defect in that crystal structure. In, we'll talk about 1D defects. Those are line defects, which we call dislocation. Here's a transmission electron uh, microscope image where you can see the dislocations uh, actually in uh, this material. Okay. Um, and then we'll move on to talk about planar defects. Those would be grain boundaries, twin boundaries, phase boundaries, and surfaces. Um, and so what I'm showing you here are uh, there's and we'll talk more about this as, as the class goes on, you can see the grain boundaries here, right? But within a grain, you have these, see these, uh, this uh, striping sort of? Those are phase boundaries within the grain. And we'll talk about what that means uh, when we get to the, 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 the section on uh, phase diagrams and uh, different phases that uh, materials can adopt. So, and then finally, we'll really briefly just cover volume defects because they're, 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 they exist in materials, but oftentimes we, we struggle to know whether we should call them crystal defects uh, or just uh, handle them as more large-scale um, uh, features within a, a more perfect material. So that's where we're headed uh, the, uh, in this chapter, and, uh, and hopefully now you have the tools so for, for us to think about uh, why defects come about and if they're stable and how we can maybe get rid of them or how we might want to increase them.